So what is a source? A source for HEMA is information about how something was done in history. This might include weapons and armors, written accounts, or picture descriptions, paintings. Richard Marsden has a great article discussing different types of sources for HEMA. And what we're going to focus on here is primary sources. So these were sources written in the period of history by people who were using these techniques. And we're further going to focus on uh, curriculums or fighting treatises, so writings that are specifically designed to teach someone how to fight. However, when you read these, you're going to find a lot of context is missing. The author is assuming that the student was attending in-person classes, or that they had a background related to the fighting art, uh, wrestling, or instruction from a different uh, sword master. So additionally, these are often accompanied by images, but these are wood carvings. These are not photographs. So there might be important details missing. You might not see enough information to understand the exact wrist angle or the exact position of the step. And the other thing you're going to notice when you start reading these is that um, you're going to find plays. You're going to find first a description of how to stand, maybe how to hold the sword, so your starting point. And then you're going to find written descriptions describing a sequence of actions. So maybe it's an attack. Maybe it's an attack and then the appropriate counter or response. Or maybe it's an attack and then a counter and then a counter to the counter. And then what you're going to have, if you're lucky, is a picture of the end position. So you can find information about where you start and what that looks like and where you end and what that looks like. But everything in between is usually just a written description. The process of turning this original source into a series of actions that can be used in drills or sparring is referred to here as interpretation. And in the last 10 to 20 years, there's been a definite increase in the availability of interpretations, either written in books, posted on YouTube as drills, uh, taught in HEMA classes, or uh, available through online classes. But let's say you want to really understand the material for yourself. Let's say that you want to understand how what you've been learning matches up to what was done originally. Um, or let's say that you want to work with material that has not yet been interpreted. How do you walk through the process of creating an interpretation? And there's a field of scientific study dedicated to this. Um, it's called experimental archaeology. And this is where you attempt to generate and test archaeological hypotheses by replicating or approximating feats that would have been done in ancient cultures to figure out how feasible they are. So yes, there are HEMA papers in the academic literature. For instance, Herman et al. Uh, used different strikes and blocks uh, to try to recreate damage that was found in Bronze Age weapons using replicas. So how does this work? Let's refresh our memory on the scientific process. Phase one, observation, question, hypothesis. Phase two, prediction, experiment. Phase three, form or reject your theory. How can we use these different steps for historical fighting techniques? Number one, get some starting material and familiarize yourself with it. If you're new at this, start with something that's either streamlined and easy to understand. Uh, my favorite is Tom Leone's interpretation of Gigante's Sele. Alternatively, start with something you've already had some instruction in. Read it. Don't worry about recreating anything yet. But see what ideas are interlinked. See where they appear in the treatise so that you can find them again. Is there a philosophy that you're supposed to be embodying? Are you bold? Are you withdrawn? Find or create a glossary of terms so that you can keep these ideas straight. And then you're going to start with the guards in the beginning. Spend some time there getting them right. Use video or a mirror to check yourself and make corrections. And when you are ready to begin, begin with the right play. So, what are the fundamental actions of this system? What is it that the other things are building off of? 
Start there. Learn some initial actions before you start with elaborate counters. Questions. Step into the final position of the plate. Do it a couple different ways. Figure out what your permutations are like. See what moves first, what different body angles are available. Get a sense for what feels comfortable and what feels balanced. And commit that idea to memory. So this is where you're going to end up. And then you're going to sit down and you're going to brainstorm the important variables. So the variables are what can change the action and the outcome. And some common ones are going to include relative position of both blades and fighters in all three dimensions. It's going to include relative leverage between the two players. Um, context or cues. Is there an initial action that begins this play? And finally, you're going to want to consider defense and coverage, not just at the end, but also throughout. Where does your blade need to be to keep you safe during these sequence of events? Predictions. Read the text. How do you think this is going to work, step by step? What starts the play? Does it describe an opening? Is this a response to something the other person does? Get a partner to demonstrate so that you can see for yourself what that looks like. You want somebody patient, and it would be fantastic if they've also read the source. And then you're going to go slowly through the steps as you think they occur. Don't worry about getting it absolutely right yet, but be thinking about each of your variables as you describe each of these small steps. Where do you end up? What do you have to do to get there? Are you safe and defended? Does your partner need to be in motion or committed for this to work? Hypothesis. After getting your framework, formulate your hypothesis. I think it works like this. And you need to flesh out as many details as you can. Timing, measure, opponent's actions that will determine success or failure, the exact sequence of actions, starting points, blade angles, leverage points during the motion, targeting. Experimentation. Attempt each step in the sequence with small permutations of each of your variables. Change it up and see if it improves or worsens your outcomes. Sometimes you're going to need to take a step back and reevaluate the assumptions that you made of what something meant. Blood and Iron have an excellent video of some things to avoid or how to tell if you have a weak interpretation. Ask for help if it isn't working out. Send an email. Uh, meet up with some friends to walk through it together. Uh, maybe at an event or maybe take a class. Sleep on it. Read more of the source. Reject your prior hypothesis and frame a new one. And how do you know when you've got it right? What you're looking to achieve is a sequence that reasonably matches both the text and the picture of the final position, something that is balanced and defended. It should flow smoothly, even when your uh, partner is no longer trying to make it easy for you. Stress testing and refining ideas. Does this continue to hold up with people who have different heights, for instance? What about different blade lengths? How cooperative do you need your partner to be? And is that realistic? Can you make them do what you need them to do with a feint? What happens if you provide more or less resistance? Does it start looking like something else? Does your hypothesis hold up under focused sparring? So spar at a lower speed with a partner who's setting up the drill for you. After a few successes, ramp up the speed and reduce the frequency and the obviousness of the cues. And once you've pulled it off in hard mode, celebrate that success. And then guess what? More work. Go back and read the source again. Keep building your repertoire. And share those new drills with others and get their feedback. Do they see something you didn't? and incorporate that feedback into both your learning as well as your teaching this new drill. If it sounds like the process is messy, that's because it is. I'm sharing an example of when I first tried to interpret a play, mistakes and all. 
Demonstration serves a safe way to parry thrust to your chest and deliver a counter thrust to the opponents. Uh, this can be done in different ways. Some pass from out of measure, others start in measure, and others yet get inside. So it sounds like measure is not really going to matter in this one. Okay. All right. If you have a good notion of tempo, talking himself up, blah, blah, blah. Um, suppose you and your opponent are facing each other without any of you having the advantage of the blade. So no gaining. No gaining on this one. Um, and he passes to attack you with a thrust to the chest. At the same tempo, follow his blade with yours. Okay. Out, presumably. We'll play around with it. What's the rest? Uh, lower your point by lifting your hand and parry. Pass with your left foot towards the opponent's right, removing your body from the thread of the point, and hit him in the chest while placing your left hand on his hilt. Okay. Uh, and then get out. Are you going to roll? That's going to roll away. Sounds good. Let's go okay. plates. Here. Yeah. And you don't want to have gained it, so we're going to be in Genati's thirds. Okay, so pretty neutral. Mm -hmm. And I thrust him to the chest from yep. the outside. Yep. All right. And so what I need to do is, it says, um, oh, he does say he passes to attack you, although that's not what it looks like in the book. Here, check it out. So, right foot's forward on that one. That's a lunge, not a pass. Okay. Well, why don't you go ahead and start a little further back and do a lunge. That'll give me a little bit more distance. Let's see how that works. <coughs> All right. So, here, thrust from the chest. Yep. And so, I follow your blade. It looks like that I'm going to be rotating as part of my parry into fourth, and that I'm going to follow the direction of your blade to the outside. That's how I'm reading it. We'll play around with it, see how it goes. Try, try to parry with a little bit more dropping the tip. Okay. I'm not worried about it because I think that's going to change when I do my passing step, but I want to get this established first. And that's the problem, is if I push you across with that game. Right. So we're assuming that neither of us has the advantage, but maybe I need to start a little bit gained because you're the stronger opponent. Okay. So let's try that again. Oop. I think I'm pushing out too fast. Let me try dropping first. Okay. Okay, again. Nope. Okay. Targeting the chest. Okay. Are we on the wrong side? So when I follow your blade, it's a convincione follow. I was thinking a, a, a push to the lateral line, but I think it's a tip follow. I think you're correct in that, because if you follow with the pommel, it's putting you on the high line. Yeah. Yeah, let's try that again. Not full speed! <laughs> Thing is if you anticipate me, 
and start going early, mm -hmm. you miss it. Nice to have you. Yeah. Well, it's also very, I don't know, nerve wracking to follow the blade by dropping the tip. Um, so after that first round of filming, I was not thrilled with what we had gotten out of it. So the play that we discussed it came across as kind of useless. It just felt bad. It seemed very slow and taking a long tempo. In fact, it was taking a longer tempo to get your blade to where we thought it was supposed to go than your opponent's action was. It made it very easy for your opponent to react. And so we sat down with the book, we thought about it, and we went through it. And I had a bit of an aha moment of, what if we got a word wrong? And that word was from versus to. The idea that attacking from the outside, there's this large long motion, your opponent has to be in a certain place, and it requires them to be on a higher line going lower from the outside. It's a fairly uncommon thing, particularly if you're a tall fighter. But if you do it from the idea of to the outside, when both fighters start on the inside line, and then they're attacking heavily towards your right shoulder, then suddenly, it's this quick, fast motion that follows their movement, it follows the line of the text, and you just do this roll over, drop your tip in, and suddenly you've used their action to run them onto your blade. The idea being we're getting one word wrong with this interpretation. Rather than attacking from the outside, it's attacking to the outside. So let's try. Both guys starting in the middle. I'm attacking to the outside there. And what's your counter? Well, let's make sure that I understand where you're headed. So, and so, that, that looks appropriate, and then I will add onto it. Pushing there. Okay. Rest to the chest. Left. The right side of your chest, from my left. Okay. And nice pull your blade so that the pommel goes up. As I step to the outside, the pass. Or into your fuse. Okay. Okay. That is clear. Aha. And now it makes sense for me to drop my tip because I'm going underneath the motion of yours. And even if I try to follow you, you're coming across. Because you're already committed to that motion there. There we go, because I want to be like hilt to hilt at the end. Alright, and again. So I do a good one. And that is right where it's placed in the plate. So if it's, I do you attack hard on the right. Yeah, so you don't want to do too much twist because then your blade goes too low. Yeah. <laughs> but, I like that as a scooping motion, mm -hmm. and that gets me to that nice position. Whereas if I'm trying to disengage and come across, that feels weird. Yeah, I think it's following the motion with okay. the tip. And that's that follow. Yes, but you're basically following underneath my blade, which is moving in this direction. Yep. And that's how you're able to get the leverage, because it's at that angle. That actually works a lot better for me than something I would actually use in fighting. I feel like you have done it to me. Just in the same vice versa. Yeah. So. So one of the most important things you can do when you're working through an interpretation is have somebody there that you trust, that you respect, and that you're going to like at the other end of it. Because certain times that got ugly. Um, I have a bruise on my finger now from getting hit in the hand a bunch of times where I missed the parry. I was a little steamed with uh, how things ended the first time because uh, he said this isn't working for me um, and so I took it a little personally at first. But then we were immediately able to re-sit down with the book, hash through it, and through our different perspectives and ability to kind of communicate both with swords and without we were able to kind of recognize where that gap was, recreate it, and then immediately feel a lot more confident in what we had done. For more information, you can check out these two blog posts by Richard Marston and Keith Farrell. Thanks for listening, and good luck with your interpretations.